Right, so now we're going to look at chapter 1C. We're going to explore density, chemical, physical properties, extensive and intensive properties, and also look at states of matter. Let's start with density and relate it to concentration. So we're going to be looking at concentration uh, more in depth in chapter 6, but I wanted to introduce the concept now. So what concentration is, it's the number of particles of a substance or mass in a specified volume. So the more particles you have of a substance in a certain amount, the more dense, the more highly concentrated that substance is going to be. So concentration and density are very closely related. The higher concentration, most likely the higher the density of that substance. So there's different ways of representing mixtures of different substances through concentration. And we'll look at that um, in relation to oxygen in the air, pollen counts, um, proper use of antibiotics based off the patient's weight, so on and so forth. But for this chapter, we're going to be focusing on density calculations. So to calculate density, you're going to take the object's mass and divide it by its volume. So I have the equation highlighted in yellow. So density is equal to mass divided by volume. Now density can be reported in a variety of units. So I want you to know the units present on this page aren't the only units that density can be reported in. It's just the most common. So in this course, 90% of the time, so not 100, 90% of the time, we're going to see the mass being measured in grams. We're also going to see the volume measured in either centimeters cubed or milliliters. So we often use centimeters cubed when we're talking about a solid object. So if we're talking about the density of aluminum metal, that would be a solid. So we'd most likely measure the volume of a solid in centimeters cubed, a measurable amount with a ruler. We'll also see volume measured in milliliters. So we'll see this a lot with liquids. Keep in mind that one centimeter cubed is equal to one milliliter. So those units are interchangeable. This is going to be extremely helpful with a lot of your calculations, especially come lab time. So you'll wanna keep that in mind. One centimeter cubed is equal to one milliliter. When using grams for mass and centimeters cubed for volume, the units on density is then going to be grams per centimeter cubed. We'll also oftentimes see grams per milliliter. Keep in mind there's other units that can be used for density. This is just the most common that we'll see in this course. Water sets the baseline for density being one gram per milliliter. If you want a table of other densities, you can find that in your book. I believe it's table 1.4. If I'm wrong about that, it's in that vicinity. <laughs> All right, so how are we going to calculate density? Well, we can rearrange the equation. We can even set it up in a conversion factor type way. What I'm going to show you is a shortcut way that I've had a lot of students tell me is the way they prefer um, in a way that they solve with the most ease. So I have a triangle off to the left. And in that triangle, you can see the variables for calculating density. So D for density, M for mass, and V for volume. So how do you use this triangle? Well, first you need to figure out what you're solving for. Because you're not always going to solve for density, some questions will ask you to solve for mass or for volume. And in order to do that, you're going to have to rearrange the previously shown equation. So a way to quickly do that is by remembering this triangle where we have DMV with the M in the top part of the triangle. So whatever you're solving for, you're going to cover that up. So if I'm solving for volume, I'm going to take my hand, I'm going to cover up the V in that triangle. And then you just perform the calculations on the other two. So since the M and the D, the mass and the density, are on opposite sides of a horizontal line, to solve for volume, you're just going to take the mass and divide it by the density. 
So here are some calculations that we're going to do in class, and I will show you the triangle way for the shortcut, um, and I'll also show you the conversion factor way, which is going to be helpful when you have units other than grams and milliliters, because sometimes, like in this last problem here, you'll see we have grams and liters. The density itself is even given to us in grams per liter instead of grams per milliliter. I'm going to quickly talk about specific gravity. So you might need to calculate the specific gravity of a substance. And what this is, is just the relative density to water. So when someone's asking for the specific gravity of a substance, what they're really asking for is a unitless number for density. Because if you look at the equation that I have present, to calculate specific gravity, you're going to take the density of an object in grams per milliliter, and you're going to divide it by the density of water, which is also in grams per milliliter. Now, if you remember, the density of water is just one. So what you're doing here is you're taking the density of the object and you're dividing it just by one. So you're not changing the number at all. If you divide anything by one, it's still just that number. What you're doing, though, is notice the units. You have grams per milliliter in the numerator, and grams per milliliter in the denominator. So they're gonna cancel each other out. So all you really did was just take the units out. Now specific gravity is often used as a diagnostic tool for urine and blood samples. It can test for kidney disorders and even diabetes. A quick example of how specific gravity measurements are used is oftentimes a hydrometer can be used to determine the specific gravity. And what a hydrometer is, is a weighted glass bulb. So if you put this bulb in a sample, whether it's a sample of urine or otherwise, you can figure out the specific gravity depending upon how high the bulb floats. So the more dense the solution that the bulb is in, the higher the bulb's going to float because dense material, like in this B example, is going to go towards the bottom, causing the less dense bulb to go upward. If a substance is very low in density and the hydrometer is going to sink to the bottom, as an example A here, because the hydrometer will then be more dense than the solution it's in. And you will get that reading as well. Hydrometers are also used in winemaking process. So if you're not in this class for a health related field, you could use that knowledge there in the fermentation process to see when the, when the wine is ready, essentially when it's done fermenting. Now let's look at some definitions. So let's start with the definition of chemistry. We're over two weeks in and we're finally getting to the definition of chemistry and this is a chemistry course. So chemistry is defined as the study of matter and the changes that it undergoes. So what does that mean? Well, in order to understand that definition, we need to know what the definition of matter is. So matter is anything that has mass and occupies space. So basically matter is everything, right? Everything around you has mass and occupies space. Your body, um, any objects around you, the computer in front of you is made up of matter. The air you're breathing is made up of matter. You can't see it, but it does have mass. It just has a really, really low mass. And it's occupying space. It's the space all around you. So basically, chemistry is the study of everything <laughs> and the changes it undergoes. Now, let's talk about these changes. So in order for changes to occur, we're going to need energy. So that's why the definition of energy is on this page. And the definition of energy is the ability to do work or accomplish change. So in order for changes to occur, energy is needed. So chemistry is really just the study of matter and the energy going in and out of systems. So as matter undergoes change, it can either gain or lose energy. And we're going to explore this in forms of heat energy um, as well as enthalpy and some other types of energy. Let's look at the major areas of chemistry. 
So we're actually studying a little bit in each of these areas. So if I use any of these terms, I just want you to know kind of the background definition of them. So you're not like, what's or inorganic chemistry? Um, just understand a little bit better what I'm talking about. So for biochemistry, it's the study of life at the molecular level and the processes associated with it. Now, a lot of you are going to be taking uh, molecular biology and other type of biology courses. So you'll see more of the biology side there. What we're gonna see on this side is uh, more on a molecular level, the chemistry behind it, the chemistry behind um, your blood and pH levels, et cetera. For organic chemistry, so organic chemistry is the study of matter and it's mainly just carbon and hydrogen. So when you're looking at the periodic table, it's gonna be the non-metal side of the periodic table. And we'll learn where the non-metal side is if you don't know already. But it's gonna mainly be carbon and hydrogen with some uh, nitrogen, sulfur, and other elements in that area of the periodic table thrown in. So this is useful. Uh, currently, one of the largest areas you'll see is drug synthesis for organic chemistry, where they're trying to uh, synthesize new drugs or synthesize drugs that are found in nature that have limited resources. They're trying to find a synthetic way to make those drugs. So that would be the organic side in the health field. Looking at inorganic chemistry. So this is just the rest of the elements. So mainly metals um, combined with some non-metals is going to be inorganic chemistry. So it's a much wider base of things. Um, the field that's really hot right now in inorganic chemistry are solar cells, uh, trying to come up with solar panels and get energy uh, through the sun. Analytical chemistry. So we're going to be exploring this a lot in lab. Um, it's the analysis part, the composition, the quantity. Um, it's taking the mass of things. It's using different instruments, uh, NMR, IR, spectroscopy, to look at what was made. So when you do a chemical reaction, especially in research, you're not 100% sure what the results are gonna be because it's never been done before. So you're going to use analytical chemistry, the analytical tools to characterize that compound. And that's part of what we're gonna be doing in our information literacy research product, uh, project is we're going to be analyzing um, the composition of a over-the-counter product. Last but not least, physical chemistry. This, in my opinion, is the hardest type of chemistry. It is the way in which matter behaves. This is on a submolecular level. This is interactions between specific atoms and bond energies um, and electrons and finding exactly where they are. Um, so we'll be exploring this very briefly, we're just gonna gloss over physical chemistry, but we will delve into it a little bit. Now let's look at the scientific method. So the scientific method is an organized approach to solving scientific problems. So all scientists use this method in some way, shape, or form. So what I have shown here is a flow chart. Now these aren't all the tiny little steps involved. These are just the basic outline of the process that scientists go through when trying to solve a problem. So it always starts with observation. So how do you start a research project? By observing something that you've seen. So an example I like to use is Sir Isaac Newton. Um, you've heard the story about him discovering gravity. He has the apple falling on his head and he goes, aha, gravity. Well, that whole thing started with the observation, with him seeing an apple fall. From there, he came up with a question. Why did the apple fall? Is something pulling it to earth? Is something pushing it to earth? What's going on there? Then, next, you come up with a hypothesis. And what a hypothesis is, is just a common sense way to explain what you saw, okay? An answer to the question. So a hypothesis is your educated guess. There's no fact to back it up yet. You're just saying why you think, what you think the answer to that question is, okay? Based off your hypothesis, the scientist then comes up with experiments. So 
the hypothesis at this point has no data to back it up. It has no analysis. So carefully designed experiments are then created to help support your hypothesis, to help your hypothesis have fact behind it. Once the experiments are conducted, we move to the next step in which the data is analyzed. From there, you can figure out if your data supports your original hypothesis or whether you were wrong. <laughs> so if the data does support your original hypothesis, you then move over to the left here and your hypothesis becomes a theory. Now, a theory is the same as a hypothesis, except it now has the data, the experiments to back it up. If your data analysis does not support your original hypothesis, then you have to move to a new hypothesis. So you're kind of jumping up a couple steps here in the process. So I'm going to go gloss over these next few slides rather quickly because I already talked about the definitions, but these are just here for you. Uh, if you missed anything I said or you wanted to see them written out, maybe you're more of a visual learner and less of an auditory learner. So I wanted to give you the chance uh, to see those definitions written out. So the last of the definitions um, being the result from the data analysis and then the theory. So the only thing new on this slide that wasn't in the original flowchart is this scientific law. So I'm going to talk briefly about the difference between a theory and scientific law. So a theory, we said, was a hypothesis which is supported by all those experiments you did, by all that data that was collected. So it's the explanation to why something happened. Scientific law is the summary of that theory. Okay, so it's a description, a brief description. So for instance, the law of gravity is a scientific law. So I'm going back to that example of Sir Isaac Newton discovering the law of gravity. So he went through and he created experiments to support his hypothesis that there was an unseen force pulling that apple down to the ground. He did all the experiments, collected the data, realized, yes, he was correct. His hypothesis became a theory. So the theory is explaining and predicting. So the theory would be saying, yes, the apple falls. It falls at 9.8 meters per second squared. It's giving the specifics of all of the data, the research, the experiments that he did. What the law is, so the law of gravity, is just a summary of all that. So the law just says, what goes up must come down. Okay, very brief on the description based off the observation. Now let's move on to another topic where we're going to look at the states of matter. So there are three states of matter. Actually, there's a fourth, but we're just going to look at the three um, that we most often see. Solid, liquid, and gas. So a solid, what you want to take away from that is that it's rigid, it has a fixed shape, and a fixed volume. So it cannot be squashed. So think of a aluminum cube. So aluminum is a metal, it's a solid. If you tried to squish that, you could not. You would have to melt it down and change the bonds, change it into a liquid to get it to not be a fixed shape and volume. As for a liquid, a liquid now has no fixed shape, but it does have a fixed volume. So for instance, if I take the water in my cup, say I'm drinking out of a cup that's a cylinder, and then I pour that water now into a cup that is the shape of a square. Well, what happened is the shape of that water just changed. It was in a cylindric form, and now it's in a square type form, a cube type form. So the shape has changed, but the volume didn't. Whatever the volume was in my original cup is still going to be the same volume, the same amount of liquid, now that it's in a different cup. Looking at a gas, so a gas has neither a fixed shape or a fixed volume. Gas conforms to whatever container it is in. 
So this is just summarizing what we saw on the previous slide. The takeaway. For a solid, what you need to know is that it has a fixed volume and shape. Think of an ice cube. You melt that ice cube down, it then becomes a liquid. So its volume is still fixed, but its shape is not. A liquid can flow. It conforms to whatever container it's in. A gas now has neither. It doesn't have a fixed volume or a fixed shape. So think of boiling water, changing water into a vapor, into a gas. That water vapor is going to go and fill the room. It's not going to stay in one spot. Well, now that we know about matter and the different states of matter, let's look at some properties that can be applied to matter. So the first we're going to look at is physical property. So a physical property is a property that can be observed without the substance changing. So I have some examples in parentheses here. Color, density, melting point, boiling point. So that's what MP and BP mean, melting point and boiling point. So I can observe the color of something without physically changing it. So I can observe the color of Kool-Aid. It's red. <laughs> it's, it's cherry, so it's red. Uh, but I'm not changing the chemical composition of it. It still has the same properties. Looking at a chemical property, so this would be a characteristic in which chemical reaction is happening. So we are changing the composition. So the example of a chemical property would be flammability. So if I wanted to test the flammability of a substance, like a piece of wool, for instance. In order to test that, I would have to start it on fire. And if I start it on fire, it's no longer going to be a piece of wool. It's now going to be ash. I'm going to be changing the chemical composition of it by figuring out what its flammability is. Let's look next at intensive property. So an intensive property is a property that's independent of quantity. So some examples are density, melting point, and boiling point. So it means it doesn't matter how much you have, that property is going to remain the same. So an example would be if I had a drop of water and I took the boiling point of it, it would be 100 degrees Celsius. Now if I had a whole liter of water, that water would still boil at 100 degrees Celsius as well, because that's the boiling point of water. It doesn't matter how much water you have, the boiling point of water is going to remain the same. Same with the density of water. We said previously that it was one gram per milliliter. It doesn't matter how much water I have. If it's pure water, its density is going to be one gram per milliliter. So an extensive property, on the other hand, is going to depend upon the quantity. So it matters how much of the substance you have. So examples are going to be mass and volume. So mass, that's when you go to a scale and you put material matter on the scale. So the more matter you put on the scale, the higher the mass is going to be. The less matter you have on the scale, the less the mass is going to be. So the quantity matters. Same with volume. The more liquid, so volume is a measurement of liquids, the more liquid you add to a cup, the more volume you're going to have. If you take some of that liquid away, some of that quantity, you're going to have less volume, so it is dependent. It's an extensive property. Good way to remember this is an extra amount is needed to increase an extensive property. Let's look now at physical versus chemical changes. So a physical change is much like a physical property. It's a change in the form of the substance, but not the composition. So we're not going to see any chemical bonds broken, but we are going to see a phase change. So we looked at those phases before, the states of matter, solid, liquid, gas. So an example of a physical change would be an ice cube melting. If the ice cube melts, it's going to go from a solid to a liquid. So it's physically changing from a solid to a liquid. However, the ice cube was just made of water. So when it melts, it's still made of water. I didn't break any bonds in the process. I just changed the form. 
the physical form of that substance. You can also look at it going from a liquid to a gas. When you boil water on the stove, it's going from a liquid to water vapor. Now, it's still the same chemical composition, its phase just changed from liquid to gas. So a good way to identify if something's a physical change is look at it and see if it can be reversed. For instance, if you melt an ice cube, well, you could reverse that by refreezing the puddle that it melted into. Now let's look at a chemical change. So a chemical change, we are going to see bonds broken. It's a chemical reaction is happening. It's a process in which the atoms are going to be rearranged to produce new combinations. So the example shown here is actually photosynthesis. We have carbon dioxide and water. Well, what happens with a plant in the presence of light, in the presence of light, excuse me? Well, that carbon dioxide and water is going to change into sugar and oxygen. So we now had two compounds, bonds breaking, new bonds forming to form two new compounds. So anytime you see a chemical reaction of any sort, that will be classified as a chemical change. Let's apply these definitions to a few examples. So the first is classify each of the following as either a chemical change or as a physical change. So we have an iron nail rusting. So would that be chemical or physical? So you can think of even just like your car rusting or a bike rusting, you have metal rusting. Is it reversible? Can you reverse the effects of rust? No, you can't. So if you can't reverse it, then it won't be physical change. It's gonna to have to be chemical. We're actually breaking bonds. We are, it is no longer that metal anymore. It has now <laughs> changed into rust, a new chemical compound. So iron nail rusting would be a chemical change. An ice cube melting. So unless you weren't listening to the previous slide, um, you should know the answer to this. It is a physical change. We are just going from a solid to a liquid. The third one's a little harder to see and that is a limb falling from a tree. Okay, so is that chemical or physical? So are we changing the chemical composition of the tree when a limb breaks off? We're not, actually. We're not changing the composition. It's just a physical change. So let's look at it on a smaller scale. So say you have kids, even if you don't, say you're a big kid and you have action figures. Well, let's pretend one of those arms gets broken off the action figure. Okay, I didn't change the chemical composition of the action figure. I can actually glue that arm back on. So it is reversible. Same thing with a limb in a tree. Like you're obviously not going to glue the limb back on the tree, but you didn't chemically change the tree. It just broke. Next set is chemical property or physical property. So we're looking at properties, not change. So is color going to be chemical or physical? Can you observe the color of something without changing the chemical composition of it? Yes, you can. So if you can observe it without changing the chemical composition, it will be a physical. Flammability we talked about. In order to test the flammability, you got to set it on fire. Therefore, it would be a chemical property because you will be changing the chemical composition. The last one, hardness, okay? So in order to test the hardness of something, so think of like having Play-Doh in your hand or a dime or something to figure out how brittle, how hard it is, are you, going, are you physically changing the chemical composition? After you squish the Play-Doh around, is it still Play-Doh? Yes, it is. So you haven't chemically altered it. You have just physically manipulated it. So it would be a physical property. Next, intensive and extensive. So remember, intensive is independent upon the amount. Extensive is dependent upon the amount. So water freezing at zero degrees Celsius. So does it matter how much water you have, whether you have a puddle of water or a whole lake of water? Will it still freeze at the same temperature? Yes, it will. That's the definition. It, 
water freezes at zero degrees Celsius. It doesn't matter how much water you have, it's still gonna freeze at the same temperature. So it is independent of the amount and it is an intensive property. Next, the length of a pencil or a pen. So length, does that depend upon the amount? It does depend upon the amount because we're looking at length. If I were to sharpen my pencil and a pencil sharpener, it's gonna get shorter. Okay, so the amount matters. So that's gonna be an extensive property. Last but not least, the color of my pencil. So say the pencil I'm holding is red. Okay, does it matter if I sharpen it? Is it still gonna be red? It's gonna be red no matter what I do. So it doesn't matter how big the pencil is. It could be a short stubby pencil, or it could be one of those ridiculously giant pencils that you can buy from joke shops. The amount does not matter, so it is going to be an intensive property. No matter how small or big it is, it will remain the same color. All right, so now we're going to take matter, which is anything that has mass and occupies space, and we're going to subcategorize it. So <clears throat> matter can be split into two different categories, one being a pure substance, the other being a mixture. So we can take these two categories and break them down even further. We can take the pure substances and break them down into elements and compounds. Now I would remember these definitions of elements and compounds. You will see them again. So a pure substance can either be an element, no simpler form by a chemical or physical means, or a compound. And when I'm talking about compounds, a compound is two or more different elements bound together. So for instance, water would be a compound because it has hydrogen and oxygen in it. So those two or more different elements combined. Looking at mixtures and breaking that down further, we have homogeneous and heterogeneous. So a homogeneous mixture, this would have uniform composition. Okay, so to figure out if something's homogeneous, a good way to do that is if you took two samples of the same mixture, and both samples were identical in composition. They had the same percent of every compound present in them. Then it would be homogeneous. For heterogeneous, they're not uniform. So if you took two samples and the samples were widely different, it would be heterogeneous. So an example I like to use with heterogeneous is vegetable soup, because vegetable soup has so many different vegetables, noodles, lots of things in it. So say you're eating vegetable soup. No two spoonfuls are ever going to be exactly the same unless you're working really hard <laughs> to get a uniform composition on each spoonful. One spoonful might have a carrot and a pea. The other spoonful might have a piece of potato and a noodle. Okay, so it's heterogeneous because not no two samples are the same. So let's apply this. We're going to identify the following materials as a pure substance or as a mixture. So looking at the first example, hydrogen gas. So hydrogen gas is represented as H2. So let's go back. Looking at the previous slide, what would that be classified as? Would it be a pure substance or a mixture? So it's definitely going to be a pure substance because it's not more two or more compounds or elements combined. It's just one. So the pure substances can then be broken down further into either element or compound. So in this case, we need to figure out whether H2 is an element or compound. And it's actually an element. So it doesn't matter that there are two hydrogens present. There could be 10 hydrogens present for all that matters. What matters is it's just one type of element. In order for it to be classified a compound, it needs to be two or more different atoms or elements combined. And we don't have two or more different atoms or elements. We have two of the same element. So that's why hydrogen gas would be an element pure substance. Now let's look at a soft drink. So what do you think a soft drink would be? A pure substance or a mixture? Well, it's actually gonna be a mixture 
because soft drinks have carbonation, so we know it has CO2 in it. Uh, soft drinks also have a syrup of some sort and water and probably a whole bunch of other things we shouldn't be consuming. So it's definitely a mixture. So now we need to figure out if it's homogeneous or if it's heterogeneous. So think about a soft drink. If you took two samples of it, would they be the same? Same composition. And for the most part, they would. So another way of looking at that is homogeneous mixtures they won't have any par visible particles in them so you won't see any solid particles floating around and with soft drinks hopefully you don't see any solid particles floating around so a soft drink would be con considered a homogeneous mixture next is a saline solution so if you don't know what that is a saline solution is basically a salt water mixture and if you ever buy saline solutions over the counter you'll notice that they have what percent of salt is in them so notice I said it's salt and water. So I kind of gave it away. It's not a pure substance. It's going to be a mixture because it has salt in it and water in it. So now we need to figure out whether it's homogeneous or heterogeneous. And since when you buy those over-the-counter saline solutions, it tells you the percent, that means each drop is going to be the same composition. So if each drop is the same composition, then it's going to be a homogeneous mixture. Next, gelatin with cut up strawberries. So we're talking jello here. So jello itself is probably a homogeneous mixture. If you've ever made jello before, you uh, heat up hot water, you pour this powder in it, and you stir it until there's no powder left, until it's a uniform mixture. So jello by itself would be homogeneous. Each bite of jello would have the same composition. But since we're adding up the cut strawberries to it, it now changes it into heterogeneous because some pieces of that gelatin might have more strawberries than other pieces. So there's undissolved strawberries, undissolved particles in the solution now, making it heterogeneous. Last but not least, pure sugar. So the pure should be your hint. So it is a pure substance. And in this case, it's gonna be a compound because if you see the chemical formula, for sugar, it has carbon, hydrogens, and oxygens in it. So it has more than one element classifying it as a compound. And that is all for chapter one. So your test will be coming up um, in just a few days. So start studying and let me know if you have any questions.